So would you say that at least for a brief period of time when you originally started uh, uh, writing as a science journalist, you had this sort of proto-religious fascination with science as probably the substitute of your previous religious sort of searches or spiritual search. You replaced science, you put science at that pedestal for a time, then you kind of got disappointed from it, and then what? Well, you know, I should say, first of all, I had a whole chapter, a whole section at the end of my first book, The End of Science, basically on the singularity. Uh, so I interviewed people like Freeman Dyson, who yeah. is really one of the heroes. It, it's astonishing to me that he's not mentioned more often by people in the singularity movement. I also interviewed uh, Hans Moravec. I interviewed this, uh, this wacky physicist named Frank Tipler, who had the Omega Point Theory, where the, the universe collapses into a black hole that's actually a computer and it's calcul calculating all possible realities at the same instant. And the way I started to think about those sorts of ideas was that they were wonderful thought experiments. I call this scientific theology mm -hmm. because they, you know, they were sort of quasi-scientific. You're using scientific science to extrapolate into the far future, and uh, you imagine, for example, the whole universe becomes this all-powerful, all-knowing computer. Well, what then? The computronium. What the right. What What's it going to think about? Uh, what What would this what would this all-powerful computer want to do for the rest of eternity? And I found questions like that really fascinating uh, in a way that conventional theology wasn't because they had a, had this kind of scientific dimension to them. So I love that shit. But um, that to me was, it was like theology and uh, not something that I thought was actually imminent, was going to happen and that people should start taking very seriously right now. It was just wonderful thought experiments and 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 uh, places where the human imagination could run amok. Well, so uh, would you say that in that sense, your criticism to towards the singularity as a concept or as a possibility for our future is a spiritual one or a scientific one or a mixture of both? Because that's, that's an important distinction I think we have to make. Because so far it seems that at least your primal, uh, uh, your original motivation to get involved in it was spiritual mm -hmm. and then scientific too, but right. originally spiritual. Well, as far as people out there go, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who are either soft or hardcore singularity believers, and they seem to have lots of different motivations. Mm -hmm. And some of them, and as you know, you know, I, I've I've written a lot about Ray Kurzweil's particular version of the singularity, yeah. but there are lots of other people who have their own versions, and I think people are looking for all sorts of different things. Some people see it as as maybe uh, artificial intelligence creating new business opportunities. You know, there are kind of crass, uh, money-oriented versions like that, but I think for others, clearly, when people are talking about immortality, when they're talking about transcending their flesh and blood bodies and living in cyberspace, that sounds to me like a technological version of heaven. I know that this isn't uh, new to you, but I think it's just obvious that that's what it is. And, um, you know, I don't want to die either. I, I'm uh, susceptible to those, those kinds of... Um, Intellectual yearnings. seductions. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but I also like to think that I'm a pretty hard-headed guy who knows how to distinguish fantasy from reality. And uh, to, as I said, to the extent that some people think this stuff is about to happen soon, and when Ray Kurzweil is talking about people who are alive today, including himself, who are going to live forever, I, you know, I just feel it's my responsibility as a science journalist to, to point out how little grounding there is in those sorts of predictions. Okay, let's let's take it one by one. I, I really want to hear what you, uh, and it would be interesting to also put forward your uh, input on a bunch of, say, traditional arguments in favor of the singularity. So, speaking of immortality, one of the most common ones 
is the one about the doubling of uh, life expectancy during the last 100 years and the quadrupling of life expectancy, say, for the last 2,000 years. I mean, the argument goes that, say, during the time of the pyramids, the average life expectancy in Egypt was about 22. In ancient Athens, during the times of, of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, it was arguably around 28, right? Mm -hmm. So in Europe, 1400 AD Europe was about 38, etc. Then in 1800, I think it was 42. Uh, at a time when Social Security was introduced in the United States, I think it was about 47 or 48 years of age. Today, I was just reading a, an article, um, well, not just, but a few months ago, actually, an article on the BBC claiming that babies born today in the first world such as Britain, for example, are likely to live well over 95 years of age, mm -hmm. right? So the argument goes that clearly, scientifically, we have managed to prolong life four times by a factor of four in the last 2,000 years and by a factor of two in only the last 100 years. Right. So since science is accelerating and uh, development in scientific discoveries are accelerating, so the argument claims, chances are that we're going to double life expectancy not in another 100 years, but in another maybe 50 years or 40 years again. So from if we went from 48 to 95 in 100 years, then in 50 years we may go from 95 to 160 or something, right? Okay. So what's the problem with that kind of thinking? Isn't there enough history to back that argument up? Can I, let me just ask you, do you believe that yourself, Nick? Do you think you, you look at that um, that trend in life expectancy over the last um, couple of millennia, and, and really almost all the progress has happened within the last 100, 200 years, because that's when public health measures started yeah. coming into effect and uh, sterilization of uh, milk and things like that and vaccines and so forth. Antibiotics. And, yeah. And so that's when you had the, the really tremendous increase in life expectancy really just you know since the end of the last uh, of the 19th uh, century and and the vast majority of that is is really drastic reductions in um, child mortality and infant mortality mm -hmm. uh, so if you got rid of child and infant mortality even going back to the Neolithic, Neolithic period then if people live to be 15 or 20 they could sometimes expect to live uh, a reasonably um, healthy life so that's kind of the, the sensible way, I think, to look at it. And you also see this throughout all of human history, a ceiling on life expectancy. So there are extraordinary people who live uh, to be more than 100 years old. I think the oldest person uh, who uh, has been recorded is Madame Calmont, this, uh, this old French lady who lived to be 130 or so. Yeah. But you don't see... You know, if if the ceiling was in principle something that could just be raised more and more, I think you'd have to see some of these extraordinary cases of people living to 150, 160. Uh, but there's nothing like that. And most of the the biologists uh, I know and the experts on senescence, they say that at this point it looks like there is a ceiling. So what's happening is that you're getting more and more people who are living to the uh, the theoretical um, optimal uh, lifespan, but not beyond that. And and the uh, the arguments that I beat to death when I'm talking about the uh, the singularity and when people talk about immortality is, um, give me a little more, give me something to to make me more optimistic. How about some advances in um, in treating cancer? How about some advances in uh, gene therapy? Gene therapy doesn't exist now, and it goes back more than 20 years now. I mean, I was at Scientific American in the late 80s when gene therapy was going to revolutionize medicine, and it never happened. It turns out to be extraordinarily difficult. Uh, you know, and Scientific American was also publishing one article after another on, um, on how cancer was uh, on the verge of, of, uh, of being cured. That never happened because human biology is much more complicated uh, than anybody realized. And well, so, may I jump in? So that's why the, may so I jump ahead. in and see if I can provide some, some input here? I yeah. mean, here's my own personal experience. Like, 
for me that that argument that that I made make make sense mm -hmm. and and the reason for this is this let me give you an example my father is a is a fairly young guy actually he unfortunately in the last year he had two heart attacks and two strokes and uh, let me mention that he lives in Bulgaria so as soon as he had the first two heart attacks he had to get a bypass now 20 years ago I think in most countries or 30 years ago in most countries people who have heart attacks would probably die as soon as they get the heart attacks mm -hmm. nowadays in a place like Bulgaria a bypass is a routine operation so my my father had two heart attacks and he recovered completely after them right so in, in, it is at least one case in which science, medical science in this case, has provided us with a chance to address a health-related issue or a, or a disease that kills people, one of the most common killers actually, right? Yes. Um, and provides them an extra life of probably 10, 20 or more years in some cases, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so here's one case in which we're not talking about, you know, infant mortality, but we're talking of actual measurable life extension technology, which a bypass is, right? Mm -hmm. 